Uh, today is the fourth in a series of events that we've been putting on uh, in connection with the 30th anniversary of the accident just up the road in Middletown. Um, the big thing we ask is, you know, why are we commemorating an accident 30 years later? And it's so we can learn from it and make sure that what happened then doesn't happen again today. Um, today might be one of the most important events that we've sponsored because this deals with the actual health effects. This is what happens you know, to people when, you know, depending on where you go or what you think with the radiation. And this is the essence of nuclear power. This is the real risk and reward with nuclear power is in the very unlikely event that there is a radioactive leak. What do you do about it? How do you control it? How do you measure it? And how do you uh, follow up the long-term health effects? Uh, today we're going to have two speakers. We're going to have Arnie Gunnarsson, who has a bachelor's and master's degree from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in nuclear engineering. And he's going to go over um, the dosage and the radioactive release. Uh, he was one of the uh, few expert witnesses that was certified during the uh, litigation that was not thrown out by Judge Rambo. Uh, and he was in the industry for 17 years, or longer actually. Yeah, the industry executive. Uh, followed by him will be uh, Dr. Steve Wing from the University of North Carolina School of Public Health. Uh, he's, a, dare say, a world-renowned expert in the uh, follow-up and tracking of radiation and the epidemiology that goes with that. So we're going to have these two gentlemen talk, and then we're going to take some questions. We're going to start off with Arnie. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me at the back? Okay. Uh, if you, if I tend to drop my voice, wave at me or something. Thank you. Um, I'm Arnie Gunderson, and uh, your your promotional information may have the, my name is spelled S E N, and <laughs> some of the some of the stuff is S O N. So if you're if you're into correcting that kind of stuff, it is S E N. A um, couple things. I was uh, on the industry side of this argument until about 1992. I um, I had people reporting to me at Three Mile Island during the recovery. Yeah. I had a TMI shirt that said I survived Three Mile Island and um, I was on television saying that uh, um, I think I said the Titanic hit the iceberg and the iceberg sunk. Um, so I was clearly uh, of the opinion that this was a non-event. Until about 1992 I started looking into it and was asked to be an expert at the uh, at the trial in 94 and um, really had a chance to dig into it then. My opinions have, have essentially gone 180 degrees. It's, it's, a, it's a significant event that we need to learn from if, uh, uh, if we're to have a new generation of nuclear plants, which is sort of the direction I'm taking this. And then the other thing is that um, from a health effect, we better understand what happened here and, and with Dr. Wing's data, if we, um, uh, if we can learn from it as well. So uh, there's, there's two issues. What happened in the past to the, uh, to the people who uh, may have been exposed here in, in Harrisburg and Middletown? And then also looking forward, what did we learn from TMI? And that's what I'll, what I'll be talking about. Um, one last thing, uh, Dr. Wing and I have never met until today. Um, uh, it's interesting, I had this, these dose release, not dose, uh, Curie release numbers uh, for years, and as it turns out, it, it uh, they were dramatically different than the, what the Nuclear Regulatory Commission says. So I, um, uh, I've been talking and talking, and finally I realized that Dr. Wing's epidemi epidemiological data, which this release data supports, but we've never met, and uh, uh, I wouldn't have known him until today. So, okay. Um, the, the title is Three Myths. There are more than three myths, but these are the three I decided to cover in my, in my 20 minutes. Uh, should an evacuation have been ordered? Did the containment leak? And how much radiation was really released? Like I said, there's more. Uh, there are more myths, but uh, given 20 minutes, this will be a <coughs> this will be a rush. So, should an evacuation have been ordered? Is the uh, is the first thing? And I break that into two uh, three segments. I break it into before seven o'clock. What information was known to the people at Three Mile Island? before 7, 7.30, 8 in the morning, and then around 10, and then around 2 on the first day. Uh, and I'll, I'll uh, talk to that. So before around 7 o'clock in the morning, an engineer and his supervisor using an approved procedure calculated that the uh, exposure in, Goldberg, in, in Goldsboro might be as high as 10 R an hour. Now, 
it was an approved procedure, and people had worked on it for years, and it was actually a TMI Unit 1 procedure. So this is not a, a new procedure. And by the procedure, an evacuation was required. There was no doubt that by the, the written process that people not in a crisis situation had available to them, by 7, 7.30 in the morning, a, um, an evacuation was required. At 7.30, TMI called the state and told them they had 10 R an hour, but they said that it seemed too conservative. And one of the things they said is that the pressure inside the containment wasn't as high as they had expected. Um, but the state was aware that calculations showed 10 R an hour, and uh, uh, but TMI's position was that it seemed too conservative. They said that um, they said the pressure wasn't high enough. Well, within the calculation, there was no pressure dependency. So um, basically, they went outside the realm in a in a crisis situation, as opposed to letting uh, letting the procedure govern how you should be working your way through. Um, what they did not tell the state in that 7:30 phone call is that employees working outside had already begun to receive exposures. There's, uh, there's at least one case of an, ex of an exposure of 20 mil around to an, ex uh, an employee who was out on the grounds before 7.30 in the morning. They did not tell the state that already almost every radiation detector in the plant was off scale. And they did say that a helicopter flew to Goldsboro at about 7.30 in the morning and, uh, and found no radiation. Now there's two problems with that. First off, the, the, uh, actually there's three problems with that. The uh, plume, was, it was a very uh, calm day and they'll, they'll admit that the helicopter actually got to Goldsboro before the plume would have gotten to Goldsboro. So had there been radiation coming, it would not have gotten there and so based on that they they said, well, there's no radiation in Goldsboro. That's problem number one. Problem number two was that the plume, and I'm going to use my pointer at the back of the room. Let's say the plume, um, the center line of the plume was right in that corner. Is that working? No, it's not picking up. Okay, let's say the center line of the plume was right there. In Goldsboro, if they were off by six degrees, in other words, if they weren't right on the center line of the plume, they could have been off by a factor of 10,000 in the dose they recorded. It's something called a chi over Q, it's a dispersion coefficient, and the plume would have been narrowly concentrated, and a 600 degree position error where they put the instrument would have resulted in as much as a 10,000 fold difference in radiation that they measured. So that's problem number two. Uh, it's very hard to chase a plume. And problem number three is that the helicopter actually arrived on site at 8.30. There was no helicopter at 7.30. So my belief is that at 7.30, procedures told them they should have evacuated. And in a situation like this, you don't, tr you don't try to change the rules on the fly. The next time I suggest would be a, a good time to have evacuated is around 8, 10 o'clock in the morning, between 10 and 11. By then, they knew that core of thermal couples that's a device to measure temperature inside the core. We're measuring 2,100 degrees. Well, normally they measure about 500 degrees. And 2,100 degrees indicates that um, the, the control, the fuel rods are entering something called a zerk water reaction. Fuel rods are made of zirconium and they scavenge oxygen out of H2O. So the oxygen gets pulled out of the H2O releasing hydrogen. So by 10 o'clock in the morning, they knew that there was hydrogen being generated. That should have surprised no one. In the hot leg from the reactor, that's the leg that would normally carry the hot water out of the reactor, the thermocouples were reading in excess of 700 degrees. Now, given the pressure that the reactor is capable of withstanding, they, it could not have been water at 700 degrees because the relief valves would have either opened or the vessel would have cracked. So that tells me that there was air, hot air, running through the hot leg at 
700 degrees being already heated by the core. Another indication that the, the, there was not enough cooling or no cooling going through the core. Also by 10 o'clock, um, they had reactive cooling pumps which are massive, uh, three, 4,000 horsepower pumps. And the uh, amperage for those pumps was very low. And that's an indication that they're not pumping water, it's an indication they're pumping steam or air. And the next thing is that in a, in a pressurized water reactor, they have neutron monitors in the core, but they have neutron monitors outside of the nuclear reactor. And the neutron monitors outside of the nuclear reactor were reading very high levels of neutrons. But what that means is that there was no water to moderate the neutrons. Even if the reaction was shut down, there were still more neutrons than they had ever experienced outside the core. And that's an indication that the core had lost its water and was, um, and was uncovered. Again, around 10 o'clock, the, um, the radiation monitors in the dome of the containment were at lethal levels, thousands of R an hour. Again, an indication that fuel is breaking down. So you had indications of zerk water reaction from the temperature. You had indications of fuel breaking down from these radiation levels. Um, someone took a reactor coolant sample. In other words, they went down to a line and they opened a little spigot and filled a, a vial. And normally those vials are very non-radioactive. This was reading 200 R an hour. That's uh, lethal in two hours. That's an incredible amount. Another indication of, of fuel failure. And around 10 o'clock in the morning, health physics asked the plant management to evacuate the auxiliary building. So all these things were happening, and yet the state wasn't told that things were really out of control. Um, the plant manager at the time, manager at the time was a guy named Miller, and here's what he had to say over the next couple years about what was going on in that time frame. They were hot enough that they scared you. And he was talking about the in-core temperature. Well, if you're scared, one would think that an evacuation might be in order. Um, pretty early, we were scared. Radiation was all over the place. Everything was off scale. Another indication, if you're scared, it's about time to at least tell the civilians that it's time to, time to move out. I should note that everything I've got up here is substantiated with footnotes in a report which will be up on TMIA's website. Uh, literally every one of these quotes is referenced back to uh, a, a, a reference document. And the same with the temperatures earlier. This was uh, uh, another interesting quote. We don't know where the hell the plant was going. Now, Miller said that in a phone call to Parsippany. Parsippany was the headquarters office at 7.30 in the morning. Uh, I, he, had the, he had the sense to tape the call, and I had a chance to read the transcript. And it was pretty clear in my mind that Miller was suggesting we should go to a general emergency, and the people in Parsippany talked him down to a site emergency. Um, and this was one of the quotes from, from his call to Parsippany. So Parsippany backed Miller down at 7.30, but I think until 7.30 his heart was in the right place, and I think he was suggesting that. Uh, it's time to order an evacuation. After that, um, he changed his tune. But at 7.30 in the morning, I think his heart was in the right place. And finally, we were not in our minds convinced that the core was totally covered. That's another indication that it's time to, to let the civilians know to, to head for the hills. And it didn't happen. Okay, last time where I think anybody of conscience would have uh, ordered an evacuation is before 2 o'clock in the in the, uh, in the afternoon. Um, based on the core temperature, we've been over this, there's clearly hydrogen was being generated. It could not have not been happening. There's a good double negative. Um, this is uh, an important piece, the next two. At, two. at 1220, the NRC asked TMI, what is the temperature in the core? Um, TMI got back to them shortly thereafter, and they said, we don't know. The computer is printing question marks. And then they said, that means the computer is messed up. In fact, question marks meant that the temperature in the core was over 700 degrees. Um, this is uh, an important piece, the next two. 
At, two, at 1220, the NRC asked TMI, what is the temperature in the core? Um, TMI got back to them shortly thereafter, and they said, we don't know. The computer is printing question marks. And then they said, that means the computer is messed up. In fact, question marks meant that the temperature in the core was over 700 degrees. It, they didn't know how high, but it knew it was high, and it was another indication of a meltdown in progress. So um, the other piece of this is that two were not two temperature indications were not the question mark. They were 599 degrees, and they never told the NRC that hey, we got two that are still on scale reading 599. Uh, in fact, they said the computer's messed up. Well, a couple minutes before two. There was a hydrogen explosion. Now, the industry won't call it a hydrogen burn, but it was a hydrogen explosion. Uh, in lay terms, there was a big change in pressure and a loud noise that shook the building. To me, that's an explosion. In industry jargon, it's a, it's a hydrogen burn, but it was an explosion. Uh, the NRC was informed two days later. Plant manager Miller was in the control room at the time, based on affidavits from four reactor operators. They all said Miller knew about it, and the control room shook. Now, when your building starts shaking, I think that's about the last indication you need that you really should let the civilians know to, to head for the hills. Um, after that, um, it, was, it was unconscionable that an evacuation wasn't ordered on the first day. I would say 7.30, but even if you give them the benefit of the doubt at 2, an evacuation should have been ordered on the first day. Okay. Uh, did the containment leak? What's wrong with that picture? This is the audience participation section. See the spike? This, this is not this is not post grad engineering here. There's a spike there. This is the containment pressure. This is this recording was available to the operators in the in the control room, and a little before two o'clock there was a huge spike in pressure. Um, the peak of that, whoop, whoop, ah. oh, okay, I'm sorry, hit the robot. The peak is about 28 pounds. Um, it's not clear that that really is the peak. The needle was moving so fast it might have left the page. Um, but the, the, the industry's position is that the peak um, containment pressure was designed for 40 or 50, so therefore the containment didn't leak, the peak was below it. There's a couple problems with that. Um, now what I've done on the next slide is I've cut out from 2 o'clock to about 4 o'clock, but this is the slide I'll, I'll essentially be referring to in the discussion. Well, uh, to me, what's important here is that before the spike, the containment was pressurized. It was at roughly 2, 3 pounds of pressure. That means it's containing, because the core is generating a lot of heat, and um, uh, just like in a pressure cooker, the, the pressure is above what it is outside. After the accident, the containment goes down to zero. It sits at outside after that. Now, the, the rapid drop was due to core sprays going on and um, mechanisms to drop the containment pressure quickly. And on top of that, with a hydrogen explosion, it wouldn't stay high anyway. But after about five minutes, uh, any of those pressure mitigating and energy removal systems were gone. So the accident should have, uh, if the containment really had maintained its integrity, this line should be about three, three pounds higher than where it is. Okay, the same spike, I just shortened it a little bit. So the other piece of this is that's the containment pressure for the entire containment. There's something called subcompartment pressurization. This explosion didn't occur in the whole containment, it occurred in the subcompartment. Some photographs after the fact, five, six years after the fact, showed uh, doors being blown off their hinges um, in a subcompartment. So it's very likely that a subcompartment could have exceeded 100 pounds per square inch. So what I believe happened based on subcompartment pressure is that a leak occurred in a portion of the containment wall and uh, perhaps not all through the containment, but a portion of that containment wall got a crack and started to leak. Um, and I base that on the fact, a couple things, and I'm pursuing slides, but before three pounds, after zero, 
never recurring. Zero is atmospheric not in this system. Now, uh, during the trial, the uh, plaintiffs hired Dr. Wrightblatt <coughs> from the University of Bridgeport. Dr. Wrightblatt's a uh, uh, structural engineering professor at Bridgeport. And this is what he said. A plausible release of up to 8 to 10 percent of the volatiles may have occurred due to the unavailability of the containment system at the time of the accident. So Wrightblatt concluded that about 10 percent of the radiation within the containment leaked out at the, uh, as a result of that, of that pressure spike. I'll get to what that means as far as total radiation in a minute. But if you don't want to believe Arnie Gunnarsson, this guy's a professor of uh, structural engineering at the University of Bridgeport. And his expert report is part of the trial transcript. Okay, to my mind that wasn't enough. So what I did was I went back into old plant data, conveniently provided by John Daniel, an industry expert against me. So this is industry data I went back through. And I found three radiation detectors that went off scale within an hour after the explosion. Now remember, most of the radiation detectors had already gone off scale. I found three that were on scale that suddenly then went off scale immediately after the explosion. And there, um, the, uh, the first one um, recorded a five-fold increase, and here's the numbers here. You can trace it back. The second one recorded a tenfold increase and then went off scale. And this one I think is the most interesting. This one doubled. And it was protected by four inches of lead. Well, four inches of lead will eliminate everything except the most powerful gamma rays. And um, the, um, so in addition to a doubling of incredibly powerful gamma rays, what this also shows is there had to be low-level gammas and a lot of alphas and a lot of beta that were also released that this instrument never picked up. So for those three reasons, the shape of the curve, Dr. Wrightblatt's analysis, and this forensic evidence, I believe I can show that the containment leak. Yeah? And where were those monitors located? You'd have to go back in the transcript. But what I did is uh, two of them, say. they were very near the containment. They weren't, oh, uh, okay. yeah, I went in the mm -hmm. annular gap around the containment and in areas right next to it in the auxiliary building. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, how much radiation escaped is the last question. And uh, uh, I should preface this. I, I, I don't believe that there's a UFO in Area 51. I, I believe that uh, Kennedy was shot by one guy. And I believe that two airplanes crashed into the World Trade Center and knocked it down, and there's no conspiracy on any of that. I, however, I believe that the data for, for Three Mile Island on releases is significantly larger than is reported by the federal government. Okay, this is how Dilbert would explain it. <coughs> the secret's in the spreading. We'll talk about that. Um, you have to remember that um, there is no measurement of how much radius was released. Every monitor was, was broken. It had failed high. It had burned out, like turning the camera toward the sun or something like that. Every radiation monitor in the plant had burned out on the releases. So what happens is that assumptions had to be made based on off-site exposures. And you know, for instance, uh, if I've got seven, I don't smoke cigarettes, but let's say I had seven packs of cigarettes and uh, we were in a large auditorium and not a small room, and I started to smoke, and you couldn't see me smoking, but you could smell the smoke, and you're not downward from and you're off to the side, and I asked you at the end of my smoking, how many cigarettes did I smoke? Well, you could make assumptions about the concentration of smoke and back calculate how many cigarettes. And there's a lot of assumptions that have to be made. But what has happened in Three Mile Island is that a lot of assumptions were made and all of them were non-conservative. They were all lowball assumptions and I'll talk about that. So the key is the assumptions. Another Dilbert? <laughs> and you can see Dilbert's my favorite comic strip. There's no more Dilbert's. Okay. Um, John Collins was a, a guy pretty high up in the NRC structure. And this is what he had to say about off-site monitoring. Uh, Collins said, my problem 
the concern I have about aerial monitoring is that for the first three days, we were pretty much into a very static air condition. There was very little dispersion. When you're flying your helicopter and taking your aerial measurements, you're actually reading erroneous readings. I really doubt some of the measurements that were made. You know, if you watch a helicopter do a rescue, what happens? It's taking clean air from up above and blowing it down and pushing the water out. Well, the same thing was happening with the aerial surveys around TMI. The helicopter was taking clean air and blowing it down on the radiation detectors that hung below. Uh, so uh, I agree with Collins that whatever came off the helicopters is erroneous. Um, second is that the wind was very light. And this is important in a river valley site. And I think it uh, rolls into what Dr. Wynn will show. Um, in a river valley site, in the morning, um, you get very, very static air. And the plume was meandering, but it wasn't traveling very fast, and that's a concern. Uh, more on Collins. Not only should we have good monitors, but also people who understand how to use them. That was a problem since day one. They get the data, and no one sits down and evaluates the data to try to understand what it means. This is the NRC talking about the data which was recorded off-site after the accident. And the last, and what, probably the most important, is they had to chase the plume in a car. Now, as I was explaining, the plume variation from the center of the plume, six degrees off. If you missed the plume by 600 feet, you'd, have, you'd be measuring 1,000 or 10,000 times less radiation than was on the center line. So when you hear about a person being exposed and, you know, the, the metallic taste or there's some <coughs> air loss issues or something like that, and perhaps <coughs> the neighbor wasn't, well, the reason was that the dispersion of the plume was, was very narrow. And you could easily have a factor of 10,000, according to a Dr. Bergeiner, who was the meteorologist on the job, um, when you look just 600 feet off at a mile. It would be about 1,200 feet off at two miles. But again, the further out you go, you just have to move a couple hundred feet off the center of the plume to have a dramatic difference in the amount of radiation you see. Um, the NRC estimates that uh, about 10 million curies, this is on their website, 10 million curies of radiation were released. Um, a curie is 37 billion disintegrations per second. So just for the heck of it, I multiply 37 billion times 10 million, and there's an awful lot of zeros there. These are disintegrations per second. And in static air, that radiation stays behind and just keeps disintegrating at that rate every second until it can get blown out. Um, I think the NRC's estimate is wrong, and I've got a couple different ways of proving it. But it's important that we're starting at a number 10 million. We won't worry about curious disintegrations. 10 million is what the NRC said was released. This number came was was uh, created by an NRC manager named Lake Barrett. That's not a place, that's a person's name. Um, and it's actually a new reg 0637 appendix C, his analysis. Um, Barrett used time average plume dispersion as opposed to um, hour to hour plume dispersion. And that has a tendency of flattening the curve. So it reduces the exposure. Barrett assumed that the center of the plume hit the detector. And I've already shown that if you were off by 600 feet, you got a factor of 10,000 difference. And Barrett then averaged seven days of data, or eight days or 10 days of that data, and wound up with a number lower than any of the numbers in his calculation. It's kind of interesting. But, um, this is from Barrett. Barrett says on the first day of the accident, 14 million curies were released. Well, the NRC's website, of which he was a member, says it's 10 total. If you add up all of Barrett's numbers, he comes up with 36 million curies. So this is the NRC's estimate, but the website shows 10. Um, and on top of that, the NRC's estimate is, did I flick that just as you were taking that picture? Yeah. Um, the NRC, the, the time averaging of the dispersion can cause a tenfold error. Being on the center line of the plume versus being off the plume by just a little bit can cause a 1,000, I put here, in fact, some of the data says a 10,000-fold error. And averaging the data changes it by about a factor of three. The net effect is that the NRC's 10 million could be wrong a 1,000-fold. NRC's could be low based on those assumptions by a 1,000-fold. Um, 
Another way of coming at the data is to use it. the industry hired a guy named John Daniel um, <coughs> to go up against me in court. This was during the trial. And Daniel magically calculated 10 million curies. Well, when he listed his assumptions, I went back through the assumptions and using his assumptions correctly, I came up with 150 million. Well, then Daniel came back and the judge let him redo his expert report and the industry's number is now 17 million curies released. Well, this puts the NRC in an interesting position because the guardian of public health and safety has the lowest estimate on the totem pole for what was released from the accident. Even the industry is almost twice as high. Their own experts are three times as high. And in fact, if you look at the data uh, and all of the non-conservative assumptions, it can easily be on the order of a thousand times higher than the NRC's estimate, which puts you at around a billion curies. Now, there's another way of getting at that also. Um, Dr. Wrightblatt, a couple slides back, the guy, the structural engineer on the containment, said that about 10% of the, uh, the material inside the containment leaked. Um, but Dr. Akers, which was an industry expert, said there was 10 billion curies in the containment. Okay, Dr. Akers said there's 10 billion curies inside the containment. 10% of that's around a billion. So, Acres number, this is an industry guy, this isn't me. An industry guy says 10 billion, a tenth of it got out by right black, puts you at around a billion curies, not 10 million that the NRC is, is advertising on the website. Um, okay, we're good. Now, uh, I have two slides to go, so we're almost done. Uh, recently, um, recently released <coughs> records uh, from Hershey Chocolate um, were provided in a book by Helen Caldicott, Dr. Caldicott, in a book, Nuclear Power is Not the Answer. Um, she has, she's quoting Hershey data in her book that shows that iodine-131 was measured in cow's milk 150 miles away from Middletown. Well, 10 million curies at the NRC website doesn't get you to being able to detect iodine 150 miles out. Um, I haven't seen uh, the, the hard copy of, of her report, uh, but she's quoting like five, four, five, six Hershey internal documents. Um, we all know, and it was publicized, that Hershey froze milk. Um, and that was a good, prudent business decision. But Hershey had data, apparently, by Dr. Caldicott, Hershey had data that would have been helpful to the civilians in the area uh, to let them know that, in fact, the plume was out at 150 miles. Um, that's pretty significant because this time of year, grass doesn't grow very fast. So the cows were on silage, which meant that they were probably getting the iodine as an inhalation dose as opposed to eating it out of the grass. Um, anyway, this stuff rolls into um, the future of nuclear power, which I wanted to talk about on this slide. Um, if, if you believe that only 10 million curies got out, um, the NRC has made that sort of gospel in something called the alternate source term. And uh, they've, um, it, it has allowed power plants to reduce the amount of radiation which they claim to release, which then turns it around, and then they can increase the power. So a lot of plants have gone through power upgrades as a result of Three Mile Island because the NRC is allowing them to say, well, well a lot less radiation got out than, than, uh, than we thought. So they've lowered the source term, which has allowed them to crank up the power so they get back to where they were. But in fact, um, if, you, if, if you don't believe the NRC is 10 million curious, then the alternate source term in all these power increases is in fact wrong. Um, there's also uh, less robust containments are planned for the next uh, generation reactors on the basis of how well TMI survived it. But I think the data doesn't show that TMI <coughs> survived it. And finally, um, there's a lot of consideration about collapsing evacuation zones or even eliminating evacuation zones based on the success of TMI, and, and I really question that. So my conclusion is that I think that the, uh, the numbers on the NRC's website are wrong, and they're wrong by between a factor of 100 and a factor of 1,000. Um, if everything, all these non-conservatives build up, it could be off by 10,000, but I don't think some of these have to go the other way. So between a hundredfold and a thousandfold increase from where um, the NRC's website is. And I also conclude that the containment failed after the hydrogen detonation.
So what we're going to do here is I'm going to pass it back to Andy, and we'll take questions after Dr. Rappaport.